I'm quite honored and overwhelmed to be here. I never knew Rohini, but I've been thinking of her. Who was she, and how would she like to be remembered? What would she put first, being Indian, being Hindu, being part of an uprooted Northwest frontier family, being a woman, a feminist, an activist, a liberal? How would she want to define her own image? I suspect, like most of us, she would prefer to be simply herself. Without these labels, that both straight jacket and stereotype one. How strange, six, just six years after her death, she would find this whole tolerance, intolerance, nationalist, anti-national controversy that has engulfed us today. India's contradictions continue to intrigue and exasperate. For example, we invest India in a female form, worship women as goddesses, castigate anyone who will not shout Bharat Mata Ki Jai. But at the same time, we abuse women, negate them, deny them access to our masjids and mandirs, rape them with impunity, casting them always as inferiors and willing victims. Another anomaly also prevailing today is that despite being such a diverse, multicultural country, we increasingly get stuck with these crude, simplistic labels and are judged by these labels and also expected to behave like this label. Take myself. I have no objection to saying Bharat Mata Ki Jai, but I do accept, object to it being made a litmus test of my patriotism, just as I would object strongly to wearing a hijab being made a test of my being a Muslim. I'm ambivalent, therefore, about this whole business of identity, linked as it is so often to religion or ideological belief. Religion and identity can be powerful tools for transmitting cultural values, bonding and sharing, but they can be equally powerful catalysts to create division and distrust. One of the most maddening things is trying to explain to the majority that the scary, stereotyped Muslim fanatic, backward, dirty, violent, with multiple wives and multiple children, is not necessarily the norm, and that most of us are quite literally just like you and me. Pat comes the answer, equally maddening, but then you are not really a Muslim, i.e., that I don't wear a burqa, haven't borne those multiple children, don't believe in reservations or appeasement, support, like my parents before me, a uniform civil code. I'm liberated, educated, happily unmarried, certainly not oppressed, reactionary, or ghettoized. Nor is my difference from the stereotype entirely due to my social strata or my family. In fact, working and living as I have done with craftspeople all over India for the last four years, many of them Muslim, I don't know a single one who fits that scary profile. Yes, some of the Muslims I know grow beards or wear burqas. Many are uneducated except in their professional skills. Quite a number pray five times a day and keep the Ramzan fast. But I have not yet encountered anyone with latent terrorist trays. And even on those intimate evenings round the village fire, where someone from one community will naturally tell jokes or bitch about the other, I have not heard even the most orthodox mullah support the kind of mindless violence now bracketed with Muslims all over the world. Possibly, I'm a lucky exception. I like to think that I'm the rule. Statistics tell us that ISIS supporters form only 0.16% of the world Muslim population. So why these myths and bogies? Mostly, it's ignorance. We all think that in this globalized world of instant electronic communication, we all know everything about each other. Far from it, the increase of so many different forms of media and information, the mushrooming of local newspapers, magazines, TV channels, websites, and blogs in multiple regional languages, each catering to particular interest groups, means that people are even more blocked into their own blinkered mindsets. 
getting information and images that subscribe to their own world view. Their new social media fatwas, young school kids sending chain WhatsApp messages, urging their friends to boycott Shah Rukh Khan films because he's a bad man, a reward to slap Amir Khan, five lakhs to kill Kanaya. In the 80s, I was doing a design workshop with a group of patchwork applique women in a resettlement colony outside Ahmedabad. Three days into the workshop, a communal riot broke out in Ahmedabad city. Arson and looting soon turned into mob warfare. The trouble spread into the slum suburbs. The patchwork women were Muslim. Most of their husbands and fathers worked in the city. They drove bicycle rickshaws, sold vegetables, and groceries on small hand carts or were unskilled labor in factories. Now they were trapped, unable to go out for fear of reprisals. I spent a week there trapped along with them. Every day, people were brought into the community center where we sat matching colors and cutting patterns. They were burnt, wounded, maimed. A child's eyes had been gouged out the brother of one of the women had been burnt alive in his cycle rickshaw. The reality was dreadful, but the rumors and counter rumors made it much worse. The local mall, we made a rabble rousing speech saying that, Sorry. yeah, and can I have that water, please? <laughs> saying that one Muslim was equal to 10 kafirs. Horror stories abounded, spread and fed by pamphlets, cassettes, and the local Urdu radio station. Across the road, separated by a line of police trucks, was a Hindu slum. I had worked with some of those women too, so on a relatively calm afternoon, I nipped across the road. Over cups of tea, I heard identical counter-horror stories with the Muslims as the villains this time. As an educated NGO lady from Delhi, my own Muslim status was temporarily forgotten. When I told Wimla Ben, one of the women, that Sakina's little son had been killed, her eyes flooded with tears, all animosity forgotten, only shared experiences of working together remembered. She insisted on coming with me to condole. The others followed. That evening, the women of both communities got together and swore not to let violence enter Juhapura again. Even after the ter terrible programs of 2002 in Gujarat, the women stayed united, traveling together to bazaars, protecting one another. It is not a coincidence that these centers of India, largely unaffected by communal violence, are those where the different communities are economically interlinked and interdependent. Banaras, for example, where the silk weavers are Muslim and the Dalal wholesalers are Hindu, or Lucknow, where the Hindu traders market the chicken embroidered by Muslim karigas. Nor is it a coincidence that Ahmedabad, routinely dis disrupted by communal tension, is where Muslims and Hindus sa share similar professions, incomes, education, and aspirations. They are competitors for the same turf rather than essential links in an economic value chain. Kutch is a part of India where for centuries, dozens of different tribal and other communities have lived in extraordinary amity together. Shared economies and differing but compatible skills help mutual bonding and trust. The Muslim khatris and block printers dyeing and printing for the wankar weavers and the rabari and jut embroiderers. The mochi community supplying beautifully worked footwear and saddles. Isolation from mainstream politics helped too. In 2001, a devastating earthquake suddenly put Kutch on everyone's front pages. I happened to be there a few days after the event. The different agencies who came into the region for relief work each had their own agenda. They attempted to create conflicts between different castes and communities. Rumors of fabricated incidents were rife and both the locals and the outside agencies were playing one off against another for everything from tents to spiritual solace. Relief was doled out as per religious denomination or political affiliation. 
the BJP under the aegis of Sahib Singh Varma were vying for adopting Dhamatka and dividing it into Muslim Harijan and upper caste Hindu camps. World Vision was distributing Bibles and the RSS and Jamaat-e Islami banners were everywhere. All we want is the means to stand on our feet again. We will rebuild our lives ourselves, said an exasperated Ajak printer from Dhamatka. Nevertheless, it created fissures which still exist. Today, there are two separate block printing villages, one mainly Hindu, one the other Muslim, competing instead of working together. And craftspeople today tell us politicians are playing the same games again. This is frustrating and sad. I come, I come from a family which chose multicultural India over monotheistic Pakistan. Despite our home being attacked and looted and my father almost killed, a Hindu saved him by gunning down the man who was trying to shoot him. My parents and our large extended family of Tayyabjis, Latifs, Alis and Hadris all decided to stay in India. We were proudly Indian celebrating its syncretic culture, festivals, monuments, music, art, literature, even its gods and goddesses. I have a particular affection for Ganesh. It was inconceivable that we exchanged the eclectic vibrance of India for the claustrophobia of an Islamic state. It never occurred to us that for some, we were the other. An occasional snide remark by a stranger in a train a vegetarian village hostess reacting apprehensively to a meat-eating Mohammedan, a chronic inability to spell or pronounce one's name correctly, were just funny anecdotes to counterpoise incredible acceptance, sharing and warmth, an amazing common yet plural culture. Its richness made every other country seem insipid and dreary. First came the 1984 sick killings, and then the demolition of Babi Masjid. The unthinkable had happened. With its collapse, the India of our aspirations and certainties also splintered and broke. Instead of a dream, we seemed to be living a nightmare. Breaking the Masjid seemed to free unexpected venom in the most unexpected people. Even in my sanitized upper middle class Delhi life, I received a stream of anonymous hate mail telling me to go back to my dung heap in Pakistan and threatening everything from rape to extermination, culminating in a box of human turds disarmingly packed in a quality sweets dabba. It was easy to begin to imagine oneself a victim. But in the days following 6 December 1992, my organization Daskar and I received countless letters from craftspeople all over the country deploring the demolition of the masjids as an act against all faiths and appealing for peace and the brotherhood of man. A typical one came from two Brahmin weavers in Karnataka, written for them by the village English-speaking scribe. God is all wares, it says, do ending, do not weary, we are praying. It is these voices, less strident, but mercifully still in a majority, that we must listen to lest we fall into the fatal mindset of persecuted minorities, a ghettoization of mind and spirit that leads inevitably to further alienation and marginalization. It would make us truly the second-class citizens some want us to be. The craftspeople I work with suffer similar forms of disenfranchisement, marginalized, seen at best as picturesque exhibits, of an exotic but irrelevant India, rather than the skilled professionals they are. There's a funny but sad story of craftspeople taken to a festival of India in London. It was winter and cold. They all rushed off to Oxford Street, brought bright stripy sweaters and socks, plus big shiny watches to show their foreign return status. At the exhibition gallery, Indian officials told them to take off their sweaters and watches, put on their turbans and pointy-toed duties, otherwise they would spoil the photographs and not look like craftspeople. Back in India, the reverse goes. When I ask the Lambani craftswomen why they prefer wearing hor horrid nylon mill-printed saris 
rather than their own glorious mirrored and embroidered costumes. They say it's because as a jungly tribal, they are not allowed into temples or even cafes. The veteran Shilpi Parmeshwar Acharya indignantly spluttered that though he was a master sculptor in the tradition of Vishwakarma, he was lumped with jharu makers and cobblers rather than an artist. Craft is a profession that neither gives economic returns nor social status. When the master craftsperson and Shilguru awards are given, the names and photographs of the president, ministers, and secretaries to government are listed in the media. The names of the Shilp Gurus and master craftspeople are not. Not a photo, not a mention of the craftspeople's names and skills. These national awards, meant to be a prestigious annual recognition of India's extraordinary masters, are lumped together every three or four years. The awardees hustled onto the stage, told not to speak to the president, robbed of a small moment of glory in their hard, underpaid lives. I feel stricken and ashamed when I think of the pomp, splendor, and media coverage of the Padma Awards, especially since I got mine on the back of the skills of these very people. No wonder young craftspeople are leaving the sector in droves. I have received many awards, but I still work on the footpath, said one. It's a grave pit, not the loom pit, said another, his grim words borne out by recurring headlines of starvation deaths of handloom weavers. When we began our Daska Ranthambo project 25 years ago to create livelihood options for the relocated villages around the Tiger Park, one of the people we encountered was Gendi Lal, a leather craftsman in Kundera village. He had lost his livelihood due to the local herders and farmers opting for new plastic chappas instead of his sturdy but more expensive leather ones. We helped him and a group of five or six other leather workers use their amazing punching, plaiting, and cutwork skills to make sandals, bags, belts, and accessories for the urban market. These proved immensely popular. Soon Gendi Lal and his group were traveling all over India, supplying to retail stores as well as selling directly through the Daska bazaars. Gendi Lal was soon able to send his son to a fee-paying school, and the next news was that he had got admission to college. Sadly, college taught the boy to look down on the very profession that had given him his education. When he completed his BA, he couldn't get a job, but he didn't want to continue in the leather business. In vain, we told him that his education and literacy would give him that edge to take the family skill to the next entrepreneurial level. These days, Puran loiters around Savai Madhapur town, occasionally getting a part-time job at the village school, generally unemployed, his aspirations far exceeding his abilities. He prefers being an out-of-work BA to being a leather craftsperson. How can we re-establish the social acceptability of craft? Both urban movers and shakers and rural craftspeople need to break out of this caste system of city versus village, literate versus non-literate, new Western technology versus traditional skill sets, and cherish the unique knowledge systems that are our heritage. If we can do it for yoga, we can do it for craft, surely. In 1985, I went to Lucknow to work with 100 chicken embroidery women. They were black burkhad illiterate, earning about 100 to 150 rupees a month, housebound, and totally dependent on the local Mahajan to fetch their work and pay them. Sitting together embroidering, teaching them new skills and designs, we naturally talked about everything under the sun. They were stunned that I, a well-brought-up Muslim woman, could also be liberated, happily unmarried, earning my own living, traveling the world, untrammeled by Parda or convention. Our first argument was when I was furious with them for signing unread a petition about the Shabanu judgment, just on the say-so and biased retrograde interpretation of the Quran by local male chauvinist Malwis. They listened to all this chat, wide-eyed, slightly disbelieving, slightly envious, slightly shocked. They certainly didn't relate it to the reality of their own lives. When six of them bravely agreed to come to Delhi for an exhibition, 
the men of the Mohalla threatened to burn down the Seva Lucknow office, accusing us of corrupting their women's morals. Today, these hundred Seva women have grown to over 8,000. They travel all over India, happily doss down and sing bhajans in a dharamsala or cook biryani at the Bombay YWCA. They interact with equal ease with male tribals from Madhya Pradesh and sophisticated buyers from Milan. They march in protest against dowry deaths as well as Islamic fundamentalism, demand financial credit and free spectacles from the government. They value their own skills, self-confidently refusing to give either Mulayam Singh or Mayawati a discount. They, they earn in thousands rather than hundreds, have their own saving bank accounts, and have thrown away centuries of repression and social prejudice along with their burqas. It has changed their attitudes to society, religion, marriage. Once again, sharing with and actually knowing the other has broken down all the silly phobias. But at the same time, they do realize that their own cultural identity, represented in their stitches and motives, is also their strength. We too need to examine and reevaluate some of our social myths and misconceptions, both about ourselves and others to see ourselves clearly and stop our sentiments being hurt every time someone shows us the other side of the coin. Cultural identity too often seems something we feel proud of, but others use to box us into stereotypes. Jokes about sadajis, guju bens, and bongs are legion. We love them, but feel outraged when they're leveled at ourselves. We Muslims talk proudly about our language, culture, tazib, and food. Others think beards, burqas, violence, and multiple marriages. And Salim Kidwai once told me that homosexuality was also attributed to Muslims. And yet, the extraordinary mix of different races, religions, geographies, and cultures India encompasses is our greatest asset, an inheritance that we can shape into an incredible strength or treat as a terrible liability. I've always thought the ideal for India is a salad with each ingredient distinct and differently delicious, blended together with a truly secular dressing. But all too often, we seem set on making it into a soup, all elements pulped into a homogeneous, boring, bland mash with a single dominating majority flavor. What a loss this would be. I love India, but I also want to be able to freely question its imperfections. Just as I have the freedom to say that Islam has been hijacked by a gang of demonic and utterly vile hoodlums, and the rest of us Muslims seem totally helpless in combating this evil. One's religion or political leanings should have absolutely nothing to do with freedom of speech, nor should tolerance play a part in this equation. Dialogue, dissent, debate are what fuel a working democracy so do the different voices and identities in our society. Intolerance is a horrible word, even more horrible in practice, but tolerance is only marginally better. I don't want to be tolerated in condescending, rather grudging acceptance, as if I and other minorities were something not very nice that won't go away. I want my being here to be taken for granted. I feel an integral part of this nation and I want everyone else to think so too. Tolerance implies you can just about exist as long as you don't step out of line, an attitude typified by the Haryana chief minister's comment that Muslims can stay in India as long as they don't eat beef, or our culture minister saying Abdul Kalam was a good man in spite of being a Muslim. I think we need to do better for our minorities, be they Muslims, Christians, Dalits, transsexuals, tribals, women in mini skirts, people with same-sex partners, artists flying fanciful cows in the sky. None of us want to be tolerated. We want to be ourselves. It's not a favor, it's our constitutional right. 68 years after independence, it still seems difficult for many to understand that Christian or tribal, Amir Khan or Aam Admi, most of us are just thoroughly ordinary Indians, seeking happiness, sanity, and security, just like everyone else, and wanting our own voice. Why can't we all simply adjust to each other in that classic Indian word? 
and the cultural budget, uh, along with the cultural baggage we each carry, just as we do in our overcrowded trains and buses, amicably negotiating awkward tin trunks, crying babies, and strangely wrapped parcels, miraculously bonding over our tiffins. It's tedious that one's own patriotism needs constant justification, plus a certificate that one doesn't eat the wrong meat or critique the nation. I'm utterly amazed that Amir Khan's confession of momentary vulnerability should be termed a moral offense. The poor guy has just adopted two drought-affected villages in Maharashtra, but he remains the third most hated man in Google's survey of Indian social media. If we women say we feel unsafe on the roads of Delhi, will we suddenly be seen as anti-national? The savage killing in Dadri evoked widespread and vocal outrage, but as incident has followed incident, the assault on freedom of speech in JNU and Osmania and the subsequent war of words between self-called nationalists and outraged liberals have obscured the other equally horrible murders, rapes, and assaults on Dalits and tribals, the ongoing civil liberty infringements and killings in Kashmir, Bastar, and the Northeast, the current callous indifference to terrible drought. I'm still haunted by the murder of that 90-year-old Dalit, hacked and burned to death, his only crime that he wandered into a temple. It is difficult to have the bandwidth to react strongly each time, but every time we fail to rise up in our outrage, it becomes easier for saffron apologists to rationalize these as unfortunate accidents stemming from hurt sentiments or prostitute misreporting. There's so much discrimination in Indian society with age-old prejudices of caste, religion, and gender coexisting with newly coined ones born of education, wealth, power, and privilege, even color of skin, all being expressed in openly aggressive new ways. Some attract more public attention than others, and our own subjective prejudices intervene. People feel strongly about Kashmir, but less so for Kashmiris, for instance. We need to speak out for all of those under threat, be that tribals, women, minorities, Dalits, intercaste lovers, the LGTB community, rationalists, thinkers, activists, even our degraded environment. It is a heartbreakingly long list, but we cannot let outrage fatigue overtake us. Equally urgently, we need to find new ways of expressing our dissent and distress at this rapidly fragmenting India. Sharing our pain with like-minded social media friends is cathartic but ineffective. Violence and entitlement may end with a hatchet or bomb, but it all begins in the head. As our educational and cultural institutions are becoming increasingly single agenda bastions and the media concentrate on sound and fury rather than content, we need the energy of sustained public pressure to kickstart this process of healing renewing a sense of the joys and benefits of free speech and plurality and a real understanding of India's past and therefore its future. At a dinner party, a young America returned IT executive vociferously rejoiced that that bloody invader Aurangzeb had been displaced by Abdul Kalam on a major Delhi road. I said that I held no particular brief for Aurangzeb whose repressive Puritan policies had damaged his co-religiousness as much as everyone else. But to call him an invader was mistaken. He was, like me, a fifth-generation Indian with probably more Rajput blood in his veins than Central Asian. The young man's jaw fell agape. He confessed he'd never realized this. He had ignored, too, that unlike the British, the wealth Aurangzeb and the other Mughals created remained in India, their chosen country of adoption. Aurangzeb did impose punitive taxes, but also actively promoted Indian industries, publicly pronouncing that his treasury belonged to the nation rather than himself. He definitely went a bit wonky at the end, but during his reign, India became the world's richest country, its products sought after everywhere. Like many young Indians, my dinner companion was victim of a one-dimensional version of Indian history. 
so much of the prejudice polarization taking place today is because of incorrect and inadequate knowledge. The standard textbooks ignore the multiple strands that make up our extraordinary country. The knowledge systems, the folklore and legends of tribals, the origins and multiple interpretations of our music, art, architecture, poetry, food, costume, and dance that enrich us. There's no single stream of cultural or social practice in India. When I asked a young man whether he really wanted an India without cricket, Hawali, the Taj and the Baha'i Temple, Biryani, Shabbat, Gurbani, Samosas, the choral Northeastern music that wowed Obama, Salwar Kameez, Shah Rukh Khan, McDonald's, the gentle message of the Buddha, blue jeans and momos, he looked a bit sheepish. We need to beware of catchy, emotive generalizations or stereotype typing national identity. Nehru is not much quoted today. For me, he remains an ideal. Let's remember what he said. Culture is the ability to see the other's point of view. We need to remember that the other is just one more ordinary, sometimes tiresome, but potentially valuable person, part not just of the past, but also the fabric and future of this nation. The differences between us and them of language, food, clothing, social practices are what give that fabric its color, pattern, and shape and make India so special, our truly incredible India. When Daskar started its project in Ranthambore 25 years ago, I lived and worked out of a small one-room hut in Shepu village. The women crowded round, fascinated by this Delhi Benji, while I taught them craft skills that they could earn for themselves and their families. Initially, women of different castes and religions wanted separate timings to come to this room. The first time a Dalit woman came for work, she crouched outside the door. It was she herself, not the upper caste women, who explained with shocked disbelief at my naivety that she could not enter. I had to literally pull her in. When a Muslim child peed on the floor, the Hindu women fled in horror and wanted the whole place repainted. Today, the 500 plus men and women in the project work, travel, cook, eat and drink together, marveling at the folly that kept them apart from so long. At the annual picnic, the men make the women sit and serve them, Hindus and Muslims, Dalits and upper classes alike. Once again, sharing with and knowing each other has broken down taboos and fears. I love India's multi-layered multiplicity, its synergies and paradoxes, its many diverging and converging cultural streams, its color and chaos, the hit and miss dugar of past and present, malls and mandirs, east and west, its unexpected but inherent resilience. In any case, good or bad, it is our country. We need to remember it also belongs to so many others. There's a poem of Khaja Hafiz Shirazi's. I once asked a bird, how is it that you fly in this gravity of darkness? She responded, love lifts me. I think that's the answer for us all. Thank you.